All right, welcome to the end of week eight and to Halloween week. So, a couple of announcements.、Uh, there will be another lunch with David and TFs and CAs、uh, next week. So, we have dinner on Wednesday at 6 p.m. in Mather. We'll be joined by a couple of computer science faculty who will be there just to、uh, chat up students,、uh, talk about their research, and just generally have a nice meal.、Uh, lunch next Friday as well. If you can't make this, although you're welcome at both, just head to cs50.net slash rsvp. And do you mind taking The house audio down just a little bit. All right, so I got a little tired of being yelled at every time I went to our own homepage, so now we've muted that, and we now just have, thanks to a wonderfully fun language called JavaScript,、uh, these flying ghouls on the screen. So you'll soon know how to do silly things like that. But a word on office hours and PSET 6. So it's around this time every semester. That students, especially those less comfortable, are feeling a little overwhelmed since things, things,、uh, things seem to have accelerated. The problem sets are getting larger and sort of less bite sized, and realize that this is to be expected, and this is by design, right? Because the goal of the course ultimately is to make sure that you guys can stand on your own at the end of the semester and don't have to be handed, for instance, a P set spec to actually solve problems and get work done. But with that said, office hours, which are actually wonderfully being taken advantage of early in the week, enough so that we now、uh, will try. Try to divert some resources to earlier in the week, since finally the lesson seems to be sinking in.、Um, we realize that office hours in the Science Center are not the most nurturing environment when you're kind of struggling and have questions that are more conceptual than they are. Sort of deal breaking single lines of codes with bugs. So, do realize that on the staff page of the course's website, we have 60 names and 60 email addresses, all of whom would be happy to sit down and not, in fact, would enjoy sitting down. On a more one to one basis and answering questions, working through things with you.、Um, certainly, myself, if you have a friend on the staff or just friendly with someone, email them directly if you're feeling that you'd really benefit from some more one on one attention.、Um, and also, email heads at cs50.net if you'd like to be introduced to someone who could sit down with you one on one. So, take advantage of that. Plenty of time remains. Don't feel that office hours are your only recourse. And also, a word on how to tackle these things. So, early on, Mario was itself fairly bite sized, and it might have taken you some Time to actually get that pyramid working, but it was kind of clear what you needed to do. You needed to use one or more for loops or while loops and make a pyramid. Now you're being handed a lot more code and you're being asked this more、uh, uh, sort of this higher level idea of implement a dictionary and a spell checker. But realize, even though the P sets have gotten bigger, There's still lots of bite sized problems in there. And so, if you're having this reaction even after watching or attending walkthroughs, that you're still not quite sure where to begin, or Marta has given you a whole lot of hints and tidbits, it seems, but you're not sure how to assemble all of these puzzle pieces, well, just take a step back and look through the P set spec. They are designed with check boxes intentionally so that you can consider for P set six the following workflow. So, you've got essentially four things to do load, unload, size, and check. So, you can't really do unload first, can't really do size first, because you don't have anything to count. So, that leaves load and check. All right, so between those two, probably want to implement load first so that you have something to check. All right, so now load. I mean, that alone might be kind of a daunting task. You might have some general idea that you want to implement a hash table or a try or something else. Well, again, and this is not meant at all to be a diminutive, take baby steps.、Um, literally, sit down with that function and add that line of code to fopen and open the dict file that you've been passed. And don't even try reading it into memory, perhaps. Just try iterating over it, as Marta hinted in the walkthrough, with fgetc or fread, and just do something simple, like count the number of words in the dictionary. And at the end of your load function, just call printf, print that number, and compile, run it, and see if your number matches what the piece that Says you should get. Now, granted, you've just written a few lines of code that are not useful. You're going to throw them away, but at least now you have hit this milestone where you can feel like you're making forward progress. And again, this, is, this notion of baby steps is something even I, quite honestly, today practice. And without going into specific details, because they're not that interesting, even something like the stupid Twitter site. I mean, that's kind of a big problem, silly though it is, that has all of these little pieces. And what I did that night in my hotel room was sit down and think, all right, I need somewhere to store these tweets. All right, so I need a database. What do I want this thing to look like? And we'll talk about that today. I now need, once I have my database, I need to import these, this data from Twitter.com. Let me figure out how to just write a little program that queries Twitter, grabs the data, and puts it in my new database. Now, at this point, my program is still useless to the outside world. You can't see any of these tweets. And so then I began writing a web page and I figured out the layout. It looked basic, there was no actual content, but I had the structure and I had words like content will go here. 
And then I saved it. And that was another sort of milestone or baby step. And finally, did things finally start coming together at the very end when I had something working? So realize if you've started to take this approach or got into this habit of trying to sit down and do the problem sets, it's not a very good approach. Try to bite off little pieces of the problem set, even if you de define your own milestones for yourself. And then you'll feel, I think, that you're chipping away at these things. And then you'll be surprised, actually, when you realize, wow, I just have two blanks to fill in. And what seemed like a big task was actually just a bunch of little Mario like problems. So keep that in mind, even if you're taking advantage of office hours, walkthroughs, and the like. All right, any questions on anything thus far? All right, so we left off on Monday talking about web pages. And we did a little bit of HTML, and I showed you how to make really ugly web pages, but the general structure of a web page. A web page has an HTML element at the top. You've got a head element inside of which can go the title and this other stuff called CSS. And then you have the body, which is where the guts of your page goes. And inside the body, do you actually put the words you want to appear on the screen? You put tags for images and hyperlinks that you want to appear on the screen. So all of the interesting stuff happens in there. But everything we did on Monday, Was very static. If you visit that web page today, it's going to look the same as it did on Monday because there's no dynamism. There's no user input. There's no automatic fetching of data from Twitter.com or anything that changes over time. So it's kind of a boring website. This is sort of websites 1995 style. So thankfully, there's a number of languages and tools these days that allow your websites to become much more interesting and useful and actually change over time. I mean, case in point, Facebook. Facebook is interesting because it changes constantly. And it's not Mark Zuckerberg there editing HTML files every time a change is made to the site. It's all driven by scripts and programs and databases. And that's what you'll get out of this week and next and the last two problem sets. So, this stuff, I frankly think, is a whole lot of fun because finally, now that you understand or almost understand how things are working underneath the hood with C and RAM and all of that, finally now are we going to equip you with some higher level tools, as promised Monday, so that you can solve interesting problems more easily and with the right tools. So here Here's a, a simple example to motivate where we'll go with PSET 7. So, once upon a time, I realized that Yahoo Finance, which looks a little like this, lets you get stock quotes and all of that information. And I searched for something like Google, which is already back at like $500 a share. All right, so I click G O O G, which is just, it's a stock ticker symbol. And then in the top left ish here, under last trade, this is its current price. OK, a y so that's kind of interesting. And I could write a program. To screen scrape that content, I could go into the HTML. So the number I'm looking for is 540.65. So let me go ahead and copy that. Let me go ahead and view source in my browser. I'm going to do Control F here to try to find it. Let me do this.、Oh, I didn't quite copy it correctly. So 540.64. Uh huh. 63. All right, it already changed. All right, so. There it is, somewhere nested inside of this page, inside of what's called a span tag, inside of a small tag, or inside of a TR. There's a whole bunch of stuff surrounding this. So, what this means is if I wanted to screen scrape this thing, I'm going to have to write a program that understands all of this content. So, already you, there's this tension between what is so easy for a human, right? Copy paste kind of wins here. So easy to do with your mouse. Well, that's not going to work if you want to implement this kind of functionality of fetching stock quotes for an arbitrary web page. Or any number of stocks throughout the day. We need to automate it somehow. And so, testament to the ease with which one can do this, let me go ahead and whip up a little program called quote.php. So, I'm going to use an extension called PHP because it's no longer in C. Every PHP file that we'll do in the class must start with these two tags open bracket question mark and question mark close bracket. This is a hint to the PHP program, which you'll see in a moment, that tells it here comes some PHP code. And the reason for this is because open bracket Bracket question mark is not a valid XHTML tag. There are no tags that we saw Monday that start with a question mark. They all started with alphabetical letters. So this helps distinguish one from the other. So it turns out that PHP is very similar syntactically to C. And this is a good thing because it means even you guys with just a few weeks of C behind you can actually leverage that knowledge and learn this new language. So I want to fetch that URL. So let me go ahead and, hmm. I don't want to screen scrape this. So, notice what I have in the top here、uh, is this URL. But notice this there's this link over here to download data, and it's a little small. You won't really be able to see this just yet. But down here, if you hover over a link, I see the actual URL that that link goes to, and it's called quotes.csv. 
And if I click this link, download data, what's neat is that it triggers this pop up and it's saying, well, how do you want to open this? Well, CSV file, comma, separated values. This is just a text file that you could have made with Nano or Notepad. And it just has a bunch of different fields, each separated by commas. So let me go ahead and save this to my desktop. Quotes.csv. Let me minimize this, minimize this. Here it is here. And I'm actually going to go ahead and let's go ahead and open it with Notepad, which is just a simple Windows application. Let me go ahead and open this file, which is called quotes.csv. And that's it. This is all I downloaded from Yahoo. It's a comma separated values file because look, all the interesting fields or data are separated by commas. And you can kind of infer what some of these are, right? There's the stock symbol at top left. There's the current price changed a little bit. There's the current date, the current time at which we fetched it, and then some other information, like maybe the day's high and low and, and these kinds of financial numbers. So for now, I don't really care about those, but I do care about this guy. At the start, 541.166, this is the current stock price. I want to write a little program in this new language, PHP, that fetches me that piece of data. And what's neat about CSV files, incidentally, is that if you typically double click them or explicitly open them with something like Microsoft Excel, they mimic the idea of a spreadsheet because the commas delineate the actual columns. There aren't more than one row here, but I've opened the same file in Excel. And so what I kind of have now is a sort of mini database that I've downloaded from Yahoo. And so this is a very nice thing because now that you'll have programming chops with PHP and with internet connectivity, you can actually query data that is machine readable because it's so much easier for us to read or parse, so to speak, this than that mess that was the whole actual web page written in. XHTML. So let me go back to my command line, and I'm going to do something fairly simple. I'm going to say, all right, the URL I want to fetch is, you know what, let me go ahead and just copy that URL from Yahoo's site. So I'm going to right click on it this time, copy link location, I'm going to go back to my terminal window, and paste. So I'm declaring a variable here called URL. I'm making it uppercase because it's kind of in my mind like a constant, at least for now. I'm keeping everything inside those braces. It's wrapping, which is a bit ugly, but that's just the URL. So now I'm going to do a little syntax that's familiar from C. There's an f open function. And PHP is neat because you don't have to pass it just a file path on the local hard drive. You can actually give it a URL. Like, don't try this in C. Bad things will happen. It just won't work. But the syntax here is pretty much the same. I'm going to open this URL in read mode. And now I have a file handle or a file pointer. Synonymous in this variable called fp. So that's one of the few syntactic differences thus far. Variables in PHP start with dollar signs, but there's no data type. I haven't said string, I haven't said int, I haven't said anything. So this is one upside and maybe downside of PHP. It's a little looser with data types. You really don't have to think as much about them. So now I'm going to do this. It turns out there's a function in PHP called f get. CSV, file get comma separated values. What's neat about this is I can pass to this a handle,、uh, the file handle that I want to read from, FP. I can then close my parentheses here. And then what I have in this variable called row are the contents of the first row. But what's really neat about this particular function is that it does the printing of, it does the parsing of that CSV file for me. So, what do I mean by this exactly? Well, let me do this. Right now, I have a variable called row. It is storing the contents of what I just read from this URL. I'm going to use this function, printr, which is print recursively that row. I just want to do a quick and dirty check here. So, there, this is again an example. I'm writing code, I'm about to throw away, but it's a useful sanity check. So, I've saved my file. I'm now back at the prompt, and I have a file called quote.php, which lives right here. PHP is a little different from C in that it's not compiled. PHP is an example of an interpreted language, which means to actually run it, you have to pass it as input to another program. Now, on a Linux computer, this program is called PHP. On a Windows computer, it's called php.exe. On a Mac, it's called PHP. So I'm going to run a program called PHP, which is an interpreter, a program that someone else wrote that's going to read my code top to bottom, left to right, and do what my code tells it to do. That's what it means to interpret. So I'm going to run PHP on quote.php and hit Enter. And what I see here is, oh, interesting. Now, this is kind of a debugging trick. Think of, me, think of printr kind of like my printf when I'm debugging. It's printed what data type, apparently? 
an array. So it says in big keyword there, array. So it turns out that f get CSV actually analyzes that CSV file that comes back from the internet. It realizes, oh, there's commas in between all of these pieces of data. Let me create for David an array of the appropriate size, size 9, and let me put in each of the locations each of the fields from this Excel file, from this CSV file. So what printr does, print recursive, it's just kind of a debugging trick here. It's showing me the contents of this variable called row. So, which index location do I care about in a moment when I want to just print the stock price? So, just the first one, one. So, let's see if the syntax is pretty similar. So, I now have in memory a variable called row. It's an array. I didn't have to do any of that nastiness with declaring the size of the array in advance. I didn't have to use malloc. And here's one of the upsides of a language like PHP, which is also known as a scripting language, which generally in spirit make a lot of these painful details go away. And they do them for you, albeit at some costs, which we'll discuss. So, let me go back to my program. I don't want to print the row. What I want to do literally now is print that field. So, print,、uh, what do I want to print? Row bracket one. And then I'm going to have to print a new line, I think. So let me do print new line. And you'll typically use the print function as opposed to printf, but printf does exist in PHP. Let me rerun my program, and voila, now I have the stock price of Google. All right, so not bad, but not all that useful. I now have a program that just checks a web page that I could check myself with a browser. So let's make it slightly more dynamic. Let me go in here and notice this part of the string. Notice at the very top of my URL, there is this. Parameter. So we talked very briefly on Monday about this when we re implemented Google. When I implemented Google, I just had to pass to Google a special parameter. What was the name of that parameter that Google used to search for content? So it was just Q. So the URL for Google followed by question mark, which says here comes some parameters, then the name of the parameter, Q, an equal sign, and then the value that I typed in. So whatever keyword I was looking for, like CS50. Well, here it looks like Yahoo has the same trick going on. They have some long URL, ends with quotes.csv, question mark, and there's where it starts to get interesting S. Which is symbol probably equals G O O G. And that's what I typed in. Now, at first glance, I actually don't know what the rest of this URL means. It's wrapping onto two lines, so let me just move it for a moment onto a new line. I don't know what this nonsense is after Goog. I do see that there's an ampersand, and an ampersand is what delineates one. Parameter from another. So the ampersand says, done with first parameter, here comes another. The second one, quick, quick sanity check, is called what? So it's F. Turns out after a little Googling, that's a format code. So what F equals is this long, crazy string of characters. And essentially, Yahoo has a little cheat sheet that says if you want the stock symbol, pass in this format string. If you want the days high and the days low, pass in this format string. So it's like、uh, Yahoo's proprietary version of、uh, F printf or printf strings or format codes. So I actually don't really care so much about that because clearly this URL works and gets me the stock quote and some other stuff. But I just want to make this dynamic. I want to factor out the GOOG and not make this a hard coded value here. And I instead want to do something like dollar sign symbol. So let's see if I can now define a variable called symbol so that I dynamically get a different URL based on the input. So it turns out that PHP has a variable symbol gets argv. Bracket one. So I have command line arguments in PHP2. So this is going to get argv of one, my first real word after the program's name. It's going to put in a variable called symbol. This line of code here, very interestingly, is going to create a string, most of which is static. But then because I have this variable in the middle of my string, what's really nice about PHP and this dollar sign notation is it will do a substitution right there for me. There's no messiness of copying strings and concatenating them together using realloc or str copy, all of this. Mess, it all goes away and it's much more user friendly now. So now, if I do a little sanity check, let me go in down here and again, in the interest of baby steps, milestones, and whatnot, let me just do a quick check. Let me print the URL. All right, so and then you know what? Let me exit. I don't even want to see what happens next just yet. I want to make sure my URL is correct. So I'm going to run PHP of quote, PHP, and just to underwhelm, I'm going to run it on Goog. So it looks like If I zoom in, it generated the right URL. But what's neat now is if I rerun this with MSFT, I get Microsoft. Notice now it's been substituted in. And if I do something like Yahoo itself, Y H O O, 
I get a Yahoo string. So now it looks like I have the framework for a command line program that will just fetch stock quotes for me on demand, any symbol that I actually want. So let me get rid of this temporary code. Let's see, I open the URL in read mode. I get the first row of the file. You know what? I actually don't need this. I'm going to do F close of file pointer now because I don't need that. File handle anymore once I've read it into memory. So now I can just print the row, it looks like. So let's see. Let me go ahead and save this, run PHP of quote, and let's do Goog again. Here we go. 541.58. Now let's do MSFT, $28, and Yahoo. All right. So now I have in what? Five minutes time, and we're not talking 30 seconds time, a little program that fetches real data from Yahoo Finance, a website that lives who knows where on the internet. It grabs it and it shows it to me. And I could do any number of other tricks to this data. This is a very simple program, but this is what's powerful. I challenge you to implement this in C in just seven lines of code. So this is where it starts to get exciting, to be honest. So let's actually now pause for any questions. Any questions about that quick and dirty command line example? OK. So it's neat, right? But you don't really want to have to tell your users or your family and your friends, oh, you have to download PuTTY and then SSH to cloud.cs50.net and then run this esoteric command just to get a stock quote, right? The web is kind of a lot、uh, more in vogue than SSH these days for normal people. So just as years ago, <laughs> it's kind of true.、Um, So, just as years ago, I faced this problem with the Frosh IMs. We wanted to deprecate pieces of paper and replace them with the web. Well, today, too, the web is kind of the place to turn when you want a generic user interface, but you want to be able to、uh, create dynamic output. So, what's nice about PHP is that just as we can write command line scripts, command line programs that we can use for quick and dirty things, for research, for course administration, just for our own geeky and self interest, we can use the same language now to spit the Output not to my black and white screen, but to an actual web page. So enter in a web based approach.、So、let me go into now some of the code that we gave out the other day. So I'm going to go into my public HTML directory and I'm going to go into lectures. And I cleaned up my code. So the paths on your printouts are a little different. I Ha- ended up having so many files that I put everything in this Frosh IMs directory. So my goal now is to implement something like this. I'm going to go away from Yahoo Finance, more on that in problem set seven. I'm going to go to cloud.cs50.net slash tilde. And again, this tilde notation is very common. If you have an account on a shared server, very often can you access your web page using this tilde notation. And I'm going to go into slash、uh, cs50 slash Lectures. And now this is a generic output. What's nice with most web servers, if you have no HTML content there, it just shows you the contents of the directory if you've configured your account for this. So I'm just going to click my way to what I want. Oh, here was our nastiness from the other day. All right, let's see if we can improve upon that guy. Uh, let's go into the Frosh IMs directory and go to number one here. So, essentially, this is all I wanted to implement as like a sophomore in this language called Perl. This was an improvement over the piece of paper and the trek across campus to register for Frosh IMs. Now, we gathered a little more data, but I chose these examples for today because what we have here are some basic form elements. And you've used these on any number of websites. This thing up here is a text field. This thing down here is a checkbox. This thing here is a radio button. And notice it's exclusive. Once you click one, the other one gets unchecked, whereas checkboxes are just on and off independently. And then you have these drop down select menus. So this is kind of a nice self contained example because it illustrates most of the popular interface mechanisms. And to be honest, if you think about almost any website you visit today, almost all of them boil down to these terribly, terribly simple. User inputs. You might have felt limited in C with get int and get float and get double, but in the web, you really kind of have the same limitations. You have a palette of four or five user input mechanisms, and the whole web has grown up on that basis. So, my goal is to allow people like, under,、uh, like freshmen to type in, for instance, John here. John's going to be a captain. A mail in Matthews. And when I click register, I want something to happen to this data. Well, first, let's take a look at how this actual page came to existence. This is froshims1.php. And let me first disclaim that even though this file ends in .php, there's actually no dynamic content in this particular page. So, .php is the convention that people use. Even Facebook uses this for a lot of its pages. That means here comes some PHP code. Now, it turns out for this very first simple example, all I have at the top of this file in between those special PHP brackets 
are some comments. So it's really not doing much at all here, just to be clear. So the real stuff is happening down here. And this is this stuff called XHTML. So this is the thing that at least I have not remembered for 10 years. I just copy and paste it anytime I make a web page. Then I copy this first line, and then the training wheels come off, and I can start coding things by memory. So inside of this page is a title for, called Frosh IMs. Then I have the body of my page here. And then there's this thing called div. So web pages have things called divisions. And you'll get used to this if you play around. I did this in different ways on Monday. There's many different ways to implement web pages. So don't think that there's only one way to achieve something. That's kind of the fun of it. So I'm using some slightly new tags. Div means here's a division. Put this block of code in the middle of the page. H1 we saw, it's a heading tag. It means make it big and bold. BR, BR means line break, line break. Form means here comes an actual form. Action is an attribute. So notice next to the word form, action, that means where do you send the contents of this form. And method, finally, can be, for our purposes, one of two things, post or get. If you want the information to be sent to the server in the URL, in kind of a long, cryptic-looking URL, you use get. If you want to hide that information for privacy reasons or snooping or whatever, you use post. And there are other reasons as well. But for now, it's an easy copy-paste. So now I'm using this trick. It's a little bit retro, but still, frankly, very Uh, simple, I'm going to change one thing. It turns out I'm using a table to lay out this page. And you can kind of guess where the table is. I've kind of got four or five rows, because each of these inputs is in a row. Then I seem to have a nice column, because I was kind of anal and I wanted all of the words, like name, captain, gender, dorm, to line up. So I kind of have a grid here. So I'm going to change the attribute on my table tag. To be border equals 1 instead of 0, which it was a moment ago. I'm going to save my file and I'm going to reload this page. And now you see the table. Now, if I'd turned this table on, if I'd left the border, it really looks bad. So I decided it looks a little better to hide this table. So we use this on CS50's website. And、uh, this is not an uncommon approach even these days. So it's kind of nice, quick and simple. All right, so how did I create this form? Well, we did a little bit of this for Google. Let's see, I have, first of all, whoops. We have, let's see,、uh, the word name. And it turns out to create rows and columns and tables, you use things called TR for table row, TD for table data. And I won't dwell on these details here because it's easy enough to tinker and realize what it's doing. I can't emphasize enough, just as I did in the basement of the Science Center years ago, the best way to learn this stuff is experiment. If you're not sure what something does, delete it. See what happens. See how bad things get, then put it back. If you then you understand what that line of code did. All right, so here's name. And look, here's the text field input. Name equals name, type equals text. All right, what about this? Here's captain. Ah, same idea. Input name equals captain, type equals checkbox. Down here we have two inputs, because I have two possibilities for users. Input name equals gender, type equals radio, value equals F. And then I literally write an F here outside of the tag so that the user actually sees what the value of this attribute, what this button is. And then same deal for mail here. I have the same thing input, name equals gender, type equals radio, but I have a different value here and I label it as M, but I could label it anything I want. And then finally, dorm is pretty self explanatory too. It's longer because there's more stuff, but it's select. Name equals dorm, size equals one. That just means show only one at once. Don't show them all. Just give me a pop up,、uh, give me a drop down menu. And then this blank one here, whoops, this first option means、eh, leave it blank by default. It looks a little weird if Apply Court is the default. I'd rather it be blank than Apply Court, just for aesthetics. And then down below, I have option value equals something. And then inside of or outside of the tags, Notice this distinction. So there's this distinction in XHTML, which is really useful. A form element can have a value, but aesthetically it can say something different. So this is useful so that you can pass in, for instance, numeric values, but actually label them with something more user friendly. So there's this distinction. I kept it simple. They're both identical, but that's not always the case. And then finally, there's only one last input to achieve this functionality. At the very bottom, I have input type equals submit. Value equals register, exclamation point, and that syntax is what gives me this button with precisely that label. So that's all it takes to create a user interface using XHTML and relatively simple form inputs. Unfortunately, the problem we ran into on Monday when I clicked submit the first time with Google. It went nowhere because I hadn't implemented the search URL, the back end functionality. So I tweaked my action line and I sent the form not to myself, 
but to Google.com itself, and that solved that problem. But that's fine. That's all fine and good. Now we need to start you know, holding, pulling our own weight here. So let's implement our own registration feature on the back end. Let's see what happens by default. So I'm going to register John and Matthews as a captain. We'll click register. You are registered. Well, not really. All right, well, let's see what really happened here. Let me zoom in. Notice at the top of this file, it says, ah, the URL has changed. It was froshims1.php. Now I'm at register1.php because my froshims1 file submitted via the action attribute to this file. All right, so that was sort of origin. Now I'm at destination. So apparently, this file, register1.php, is registering the user. It's emailing that proctor in Wigglesworth, or it's recording it in a database or something. Well, let's take a look. I'm going to now open register1.php, which you also have a copy of. Let me scroll down. Come on. Come on.、Oh. Any questions? <laughs> Come on. All right. Plan B. And, oh, there we go. OK. All right, now it's color coded. OK, a y so let's take a look here. All right, it looks like I do have some PHP code at the top of register one. Let's come back to that in a moment. Most of it's comments, but there is some interesting stuff there. Let me scroll down. Oh, this is kind of a cop out. All I did for the resulting page is I spit out, you are registered. Well, not really. So the code must be up top. So let's see. And this is OK. a y So notice now what I've done for the first time. I now have PHP code. Inside of a file that also has XHTML. So, this is one of the upsides of using something like PHP. You can commingle PHP code and logic with actual raw content. Anything in between the open bracket question mark and the close question mark close bracket means PHP, the program, the interpreter that I ran before, you deal with this part. And what PHP's purpose in life, as we saw at the command line, is just to produce output, to spit out text. In my very simple stock quote program, I just spit out the stock price. But there's nothing saying I can't spit out XHTML. right? If I really wanted to be clever, let me go back to my quote program. Recall it just looked like this.、It、looks like I have the power to print anything I want. So technically, I could do something like print HTML, print、uh, head, print, and so forth. This is all it takes to start generating web pages dynamically. Just generate via print or similar calls the actual XHTML and content you want the browser to see. So, this was a command line script, my quote program. Now I'm doing something inside of my web directory, public HTML, but the idea is the same. Anything I print will show up in the browser window and not on this black and white screen. So, what logic am I doing? Well, a very common case with form submission is you've got to validate it. Right? You don't want garbage going into your database. You don't want spam. You don't want non existent usernames and passwords and all of this. So, a very simple way of checking what the user has done is with some conditions. So, in PHP, we have ifs and elses and fors and whiles and all of this stuff. So, notice what I've done here. And it wraps a little ugly here, but notice what I've done. If dollar sign underscore post bracket name. So, it turns out, and this is a real convenience in this particular language, anytime a user fills out a form, and that form used method equals quote unquote post, everything the user typed in on the web page is sent from point A to B, from browser to server, but then it is packaged up really nicely inside of an array. And that array is called dollar sign underscore post. Stupid name, but it's all in there for you, which is really nice because using square bracket notation, I can then access the name of any parameter that was in those forms. And I had a few parameters I had name, I had captain, I had gender, I had dorm. So if I want to check if the user typed anything in for their name, I simply ask if dollar sign underscore post bracket quote unquote name equals equals nothing, quote unquote. That's bad. I want to redirect them back and have them do it again. Or if they fail to give me their gender, I don't like that either. I'm going to reject their input. Or if they gave me a blank dorm equals quote, 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 I'm going to reject their input. So this whole if condition has three clauses. If no name or no gender or no dorm, what do we do? Well, a little trick in PHP is if you want to redirect the user elsewhere,、uh, you call a function called header. And you specify location, colon, and then the URL that you want to send them back to. So, had I not behaved well here, had I been to this registration page and I said, You don't need to know my name, I'm just going to show up, and I'm going to click register, 
Nothing good happened this time. I got redirected back to the page, presumably so that I can re enter the input. Now, good websites would actually say, hey, no name, you need to give us your name. I have no feedback here, no error messages. So it's not perfect, but it at least rejected the user's input. Unfortunately, did I actually register the user in any sense if they do provide legit values? No, I just kind of tell them that they're registered, but really nothing happens with it. So let's take things up a notch and actually register the user. And, you know, I don't really know much about databases yet, so let me take a look at,、uh, let me take a peek at version four of this. So four is, let me see, do I want to do four? No, let me see, five. Come on, where's the one I'm looking for? Uh huh. Submits to itself. Can't remember my own numbering scheme. OK. Uh huh. Damn it. Oh, right. I'm looking in the wrong place. Sorry. Register three.、Whew. OK. We didn't need to get that high. All right. So let's take a look at this one, Frosh IMs 3. It's actually going to look almost the same. So let me go to Frosh IMs 3.php. Form is the same. And let's do a quick check at the code. This is Frosh IMs 3. If I scroll down, scroll down, the only difference in this code is that I changed the action line to go to register 3. So I tried to number these things so that they line up so that when you read it over on paper, you can see which corresponds to which. So register 3.php is the destination, but the form. Is exactly the same. There's really nothing different here. So let me quit this and let me open register3.php. So let's see, I took a slightly different approach, but my goal now was let's actually solve this problem of registering users. Well, I didn't know much about databases in 1996, and frankly, the proctor didn't really know much about databases, so that would have been overkill to use a database, but this proctor did use email. And a reasonable upgrade from pieces of paper underneath their door was send them an email that they can then filter and keep track of registrants that way. That was an improvement. Not perfect, but better. Well, it turns out that languages like PHP make it really easy to do things like send email. So, in this version of register, notice the very top of the file is just a bunch of comments inside of the open bracket question mark. But then I do some sanity checking. If the name field in post equals,、uh, does not equal empty, and the gender field does not equal empty, and the dorm does not equal empty. So, I chose a different syntax just to illustrate that you can use ampersand, ampersand, you can use not equals. So, I've changed the logic to say if none of these fields are blank, That's a good thing. Let's proceed to send an email. Well, what email do I want to send? Well, let's create on the fly here a little variable called two. And I've hard coded in my email address for demo purposes, but I would have put the proctors here years ago.、Uh, subject line is going to be registration.、Uh, body is going to be the following. Now, body, I wanted to just put the contents of the registration. It doesn't need to be beautiful, but it did need to be a few lines long, so the email was not one long string. So I did this trick body equals. This person just registered. Backslash n, backslash n, which does enter, enter. And then notice this. What do you think the dot operator does here? Dot. So this is concatenation. So, if you ever thought about trying to take a string in C and append it to another string in C, it's a real pain in the neck. You have to allocate RAM for it using malloc or the equivalent. You have to use str cat for string concatenation. It's a whole bunch of steps to do something simple. In PHP, in JavaScript, in Perl, in lots of these higher level languages, there's a single operator. Dot means take this string between quotes and concatenate it with the next string between quotes. So, this is just my nice, pretty printed way of creating a multi line string. All inside a variable called body. So, what am I putting in this email? Well, this sentence, this person just registered. Then I put the person's name. Then I put whether or not they're a captain. Then I put their gender. Then I put their dorm. Then I put a typo. And then I put a semicolon. And that ends the string. And then finally, I have to add this in PHP. And I know this because I read the manual for PHP a headers variable that tells the email who it should come from. Notice this subtlety here. This is sort of a legacy thing from email and from Windows and DOS. Backslash R, backslash N means carriage return and new line. They're slightly different ideas. For now, it's、uh, just assume you have to do that. And then finally, PHP has a function. It's called mail. It takes a to field, a subject field, a body field, and then these headers. And you know what? When you, hit, when it, you get to the semicolon, it sends an email. Now, again, I challenge you to do something like that in C without a whole bunch of lines of code. So let's see if this works. And let's cross our fingers that email is actually reliable. But notice that I have my else now. If the user failed to give me a name or a gender or a dorm, I reject them. I bounce them back to froshims3.php. But notice this if I send the mail, 
Notice, I don't redirect the user upon success to another URL. This code that we just discussed executes. That is, the else condition does not execute. So PHP continues on its merry way. It has not seen the command exit. So PHP keeps reading and reading. PHP sees, oh, here's the end of the PHP portion of this file. So what does PHP do now? Well, if the PHP interpreter encounters just raw XHTML or graphics or images or, or rather、uh, email addresses and all of this, it spits it out literally. It just dumps it to the screen unprocessed. So to be clear, this open bracket question mark is a directive to PHP saying, Here is code that you need to analyze and execute. The rest of this is just fluffy XHTML and static content. But I've commingled them, and that's just kind of nice and convenient here. All right, so fingers crossed. I'm going to go into、uh, the form here. I'm going to register John again. I'm going to do a Captain, Mail, and Matthews. And I'm going to click, actually, let's do this in advance. I'm going to go to my email account. All right, I'm going to log in here to my Gmail like inbox. And OK, so I've got no mail, no friends, no mail at this particular account. So, fingers crossed, click register. OK, you are registered really, so that code seemed to execute. Now, fingers crossed, otherwise, this will be the most disappointing demo today. Let's reload.、Oh. It worked. So I got an email now from me because I sent it to myself saying this person just registered. And this is literally all the Frosh IM's registration was in 1996. It was a different language, kind of a different interface, but we just emailed the proctor this, and this was a huge leap forward. And relatively easy just to be, just to reinforce all it took to make that. Functionality happen, which is arguably pretty useful for almost any student group on campus that just needs signups for something, took a few lines of code. Let's take a five minute break. OK. All right, we are back. So that was a lot of new stuff. So let's just paint a complete picture here. So the first example I did was this stock quote program. And I wrote that as a command line program. So I had to explicitly tell my shell, my blinking prompt, how to interpret this code. And that's why I wrote PHP space and then quote.php. But clearly, I've not been doing that for the web interaction. Well, it turns out one of the features provided by modern web services is the ability to interpret other languages besides just XHTML. Typically, a web server's purpose in life is to take in a request via a URL, look at the file name, and it's foo.php. HTML, it finds foo.html on its hard drive, and then it spits out those bytes back to the internet, and the browser displays them per Monday's conversation. But in this context, the web server needs to do a little more. The web server needs to actually analyze the file, like froshims1.php, look, look for open bracket question mark, and convert any of the code in there. To raw textual output. In other words, if there's any print lines, it needs to send those、uh, strings to the browser in addition to any of the static content. So, this is, long story short, a simple configuration issue. If you run your own web server, if you're a system administrator with a server, you can simply configure your web server software. It's often called Apache or IIS, although there are others.、Um, you configure your web server to know that .php files, if you ever see a URL with .php, Make sure to pass it first to php.exe, the interpreter or the equivalent, get back the results and send the results to the user's browser. So there's a bit of a middleman process there in the form of this interpreter. And so, in fact, serving up PHP content is actually less efficient. Certainly, than spitting out raw content. And in fact, we'll see probably next week that implementing programs in PHP and higher level languages like it often is so much easier for development and it just gets the job done fast, but not necessarily very efficiently. You'll see, and I'll be able to implement,、uh, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'll be able to implement problem set six in essentially one line of code of PHP on Monday. And that's great, if not frustrating, but its performance will suck. It will take much, much longer to run than your C based implementation. So, there is actually a reason for teaching the lower level details. It will actually serve you well. Realize, even as you start to take for granted certain features, certainly a smart person and a computer scientist, as opposed to just someone who has some programming background, you'll understand the nuances of picking this algorithm or this data structure or this language or that. And again, that's one of the goals here. Now, an interesting question came up during、um, break, which was what's to stop me from saying this is not from myself, but say our own head teaching fellow, Jan Su Aidida? Well, nothing. So let's go ahead and register. And in fact, um, uh, let's say 
Uh, let's say, in fact, that uh, question mark, huh? Uh huh. How about uh, uh, hmm? Oh, what's something? I got nothing. I got nothing funny here. So this is not really from Jansu. All right. All right. So I've appended a stupid string there, but I've changed the from URL, the from uh, value there in the headers. So let me save this. Let me go back to my web page. Let me go back to the form. Let's go ahead and register not John but uh, Sam. Click register. Okay. You are registered really. Let's go to my. Oh, it's already there. Oh, thank you, Jansu. And here we have a message from ida.fas.harvard.edu. So now, so easy to do. Don't do it. So technically, doing stuff like this within Harvard's campus is against the ad board rules and all of this. I learned this the hard way freshman year when I did this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually did. Stupid freshman. Um, and I had forged an email. We, we had some stupid banter going back and forth among our proctor group. And I decided to chime in on behalf of someone who I disagreed with. So I thought I'd change his opinion. <laughs> Really bad idea. But like an idiot, I was using a mail program that automatically appended to the bottom of all my emails my signature, DJM. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, not so bright. Um, I was caught. So don't do this. Do as I, don't do as I do, do as I say. Um, anyhow. So it is that easy, but frankly, you can spend a whole course talking about how the internet works and why actually this is very reasonable that it is that easy to do. There's really no authentication when it comes to email these days. So let's take a look at a slight variant of that first example. This is froshims2.php. And remember, this first example was pretty lame because if I made a mistake, I was not so much as even informed of it. I was just sent back to the original page, which makes me feel like the website is broken, not my own input. So let me try again, input myself. I'll be captain, mail, uh, mail from Matthews, and let's click register. OK, that worked, sort of. But let's go back now and forget my name and click register. OK, so now we have some user feedback. So before, I was just punting. I was sending the user on their merry way if I screwed up. But if I go back into froshims2, notice that this version, almost the same, but it submits to register2. So I'm going to open up register2.php. And in here, I see, oh, interesting. There's actually no logic up at the top. So to make clear the, the structure of PHP, this is a good thing and a bad thing. PHP is kind of a messy language because you are commingling code with static content. And in general, especially for complex projects, this is frowned upon because things get messy very easily. But the upside is it's so damn easy to do things quickly. Right? Even that Twitter site, again, I'll harp on it, only took a couple of nights of playing around to get working. and. You know, it's not the most beautiful thing underneath the hood. I could, I could completely over-engineer it with something like Java. But my goal was just to do it and get to sleep. So again, these are trade-offs. It's just another resource, your own time, that is a factor when deciding, design, making design decisions. So here, notice what I've done for the first time. Inside of the body of my page, I've actually said, oh, wait, web server, here comes some logic. Process this before sending the output to the browser. And notice I've done this, open bracket, um, question mark. Then I have if post name equals equals nothing. So I have that same check. So notice what I do this time. If any of those fields are blank, Notice here at the end of the if statement, new syntactic detail, I have a colon because I then have a close question mark, close bracket. So this means logically, if the stuff in between these two angled brackets and question marks evaluates to true, spit out the following stuff raw. Just send it to the browser. So what do I send? Well, I'm sending to the browser this sentence, you must provide your name, gender, and dorm, go to this URL, go back. So I'm just yelling at the user. Else, notice this, I'm back in PHP mode, open bracket, question mark, close uh, bracket here, else, colon, you are registered. And just as an aside, um, no, let's keep it simple like that. The new syntactic detail here, too, is at the end of this block, I explicitly say end if, so PHP knows that's the end of this condition. So you can drop in and out of PHP mode fairly seamlessly just to put different content where you want. So that alone is, is useful. And there's one other paradigm that I wanted to introduce before we improve this otherwise fairly quick and dirty 
uh, Frosh IM's registration. So now this version is fundamentally different. This is Frosh IM's 4.php, which you also have a printout of. It's kind of kind of rubs me the wrong way that I have files like Frosh IM's 1 submitting to register 1 and Frosh IM's 2 submitting to register 2. Because what happens is if there's a mistake, the user has to hit back, the back button. And the problem with this on a lot of websites is if you hit back and you've just filled out a really big form but you made a mistake, what happens sometimes when you hit back? Right, you lose all of the form. There's nothing more infuriating than a poorly designed form, especially when it's asking you lots of questions. Now, this really lends itself to that risk. If I click back, unless my browser is being friendly to me, I'm going to lose some of the content. Not always. It depends on various design decisions, but that can happen. And just plus, it'd be a lot nicer in terms of user interface. Give me the feedback on the same page that the problem exists on. Don't, make, don't put the burden on me. You're the computer. You're smart enough to know where the problem was. Show me. Don't tell me. So Frosh IMs 4 is a fundamentally different approach in that if I scroll down to my action line here, notice to what file it happens to submit. It submits to itself. So this is kind of a neat trick. And it allows you to clean up your code a little bit and consolidate into fewer files. So now I have Frosh IMs 4.php submitting to Frosh IMs 4.php. And that's fine. But now I have to consider there's kind of two cases here. Someone's going to visit Frosh IMs 4.php with a browser either for the first time, in which case I need to just show them the form. There's no errors. There's no yelling. Just show them the form because they're here for the first time. But case two is they're here. They've submitted. They're back here. Now I've got some input from them, I need to tell them either yay or nay that they did a good job filling out this form. So there's two cases. So that just sort of asks for a condition at the top of the file. So let's scroll up to the same file, Frosh IMs4. And aha, there is in fact an if condition here. So I'm doing this little check. And there's many different ways to do this. I tried to pick a simple one. If the value of action which is some parameter defined in the form is non-zero, if it's true, if there's anything there, do the following. So this very simple if clause at the top of this file is just a little check. Was the form submitted or not? If it was submitted, proceed to execute the following lines of code. If it was not just submitted, just go about your merry way, dump the entire contents that are static to the web page, and be done with it as usual. So what am I doing if the form was submitted? Well, I'm doing this sanity check. So if the name field is blank, or gender is blank, or dorm is blank, Hmm, interesting. I'm setting a new variable called error equal to true. So PHP supports Boolean values as well. And notice I have not declared error. So this is a good thing and a bad thing. I have declared error inside of curly braces, no less. But unlike C, which would have this variable error living only within this tightly structured scope, it would disappear elsewhere. Turns out is the moment you declare a variable in PHP, if it's outside, if it's not in a function, if it's in the file itself, it becomes global automatically. So that's useful. It's also a little messy, but it's a trade-off here. So this means error is true if the user failed to provide a name, gender, or dorm, but it's just not set. It's false if they didn't make those mistakes. So I get an implicit value of false. So where is this useful? Well, let me scroll down to the actual content of the page. Notice that this isn't quite all raw HTML this time, or XHTML. Notice that I very subtly nested inside of this file this line here. Beneath the big, bold setting heading of register for Frosh IMs, notice I've got a condition. I dropped into PHP mode momentarily, and I said if error. So if error is true, if I actually set it up top in the file, what do I print? Well, what message gets printed? You must fill out the form. How did I do this? Well, it turns out there's this a tag called div. Div makes a division of the page. It's like putting an invisible rectangle on the page that you can fill with content. Style is very related to our discussion of CSS on Monday. This is just a quick and dirty way of changing the style of an individual tag. Classes and that stuff that we discussed very briefly is a way of factoring out this. But I just wanted something quick and dirty. So I say the following style of this text should be red, color col uh, colon red. So let's see what happens. This is froshims4.php. And let me go in here, hit Enter. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and not provide my name, but I'll say Captain Mail and Matthews again and register. 
so much better. So, still imperfect, lots of rooms for improvement still, but now we're finally taking baby steps, if you will, toward a much more realistic website that provides you with immediate feedback. This is not the only way you could implement this logic. I could have done the checking later in the form, maybe. I could have used different variable names. So, realize too, the process of implementing P sets 7 and 8 will be somewhat exploratory, and you'll see different paradigms from me and from the teaching fellows, because a lot of this stuff is fairly young, too, and it's a language that's constantly evolving, PHP in particular. So, there's different Approaches to these kinds of tricks. But the basic ideas all boil down to like weak zeros concepts, which is kind of cool that these same things are now actually proving useful. So the problem now is that we're using my Gmail account for the registrations. And this doesn't scale very well. If you're running something like Model UN and you have hundreds of registrations, not just a few, a handful from captains around campus, you kind of need something better. I mean, even an Excel spreadsheet would be nice because then we can manipulate things. I don't have to copy and paste. So I'd kind of like to have a Microsoft Excel document that maybe has something like a column for name. And then captain, no, yes or no, and then gender, and then dorm. And I then like row by row by row all of the registrants for Frosh IMs. Well, I can do a number of things here. With PHP, just as I can generate raw text, as we saw with my quotes program, just as I can generate XHTML, as I started to with that same example, and we've been doing here. I could also just generate a text file that has a bunch of fields separated by what special character? So, I could just use commas. I could write a program that, just like you guys are doing, did for problem set five, you used OPF open to create a new file and dump binary data to it. You could just print textual data. So, I could create my own little database in just a CSV file in my account. And that's not bad, but it also doesn't scale, right? Facebook was not implemented with CSV files, and most websites, even CS50's website, does not use simple text files because you want a little more dynamism and you want more performance. You want more performance than simple text files allow. So there exist these things in the world called databases. MySQL is a popular one, and it's one that still drives much of Facebook.、Um, Oracle is another one. Microsoft Access,、uh, uh, SQL Server is another. There's a whole bunch of them. Some of them are free. Some of Them are not free. MySQL happens to be free, and it happens to be the most popular one, at least in the open source community and also just in typical websites. So, if you guys go out after 50 for your student group or for your personal use and go buy a domain name and host it somewhere, odds are you'll have access to MySQL. So, that's what we're going to use for CS50. MySQL is a relational database. A relational database just means that all of your data is stored in rows and columns, multiple tables. So, essentially, what a relational database gives you is a fancy version of Microsoft Excel. Excel has, as you may know, this feature of worksheets. And in the bottom left here is where I'm clicking. So, think of an Excel document as a database. Think of worksheets as tables. So, what you will be given for problem set seven is your own database. It's going to be called username underscore p set seven. And in that database, can you create any number of tables? And you're going to have to create one or more tables to implement this thing called CS50 Finance. But let's see if we can't take a step toward that idea by solving this Frosh IMs problem a little better. What I essentially want to do is implement a database that stores fields like this. Well, you could do this. Back in the day, if you wanted to use a database, you would type a command like MySQL and you would specify the host,、uh, which is going to be,、uh, what do I want to say here?、Um, let me do one little difference here.、Um, You would do a type of command, MySQL. You would specify your username. You would specify dash p for your password. And then you would get a very retro, black and white, ASCII art like interface to a database. Kind of annoying, even though MySQL itself is very powerful. So it's kind of underwhelming for what this thing can do. I mean, Facebook is, not to harp on that particular example, driven largely today by MySQL databases. So let's take a look at what this looks like. We have a program, and it's actually free. Which is why we went with it, and it's very popular, and it's called PHP My Admin. This is just something that some really nice people wrote. It's freely available, and it's a graphical interface to managing a MySQL database. There are many different ways to manage a database. A database is just tables stored in memory, but actually interfacing with them is nice to do via a graphical user interface. So I'm going to log in with my mailin username. 
and with my mailin password here. And I'm going to get this interface. And you'll get to know this interface a little bit with PSET 7 and 8. I'm just going to give you some highlights today. Most of this is overwhelming and unnecessary today. But notice at top left, I have a list of databases. I already created for myself a database for my CS50 final project for PSET 7 and PSET 8, and then also for lecture today. So if I click this database, what I now have is a way of controlling these tables that I need to create. So right now, I actually have one table because I was practicing before class. I'm going to click very quickly this little X button and get rid of that. So now I have a database with zero tables. Think of this as an empty Excel document. So I need to define some structure. Well, I'm going to click Structure. Actually, no.、Uh, and then it's going to ask me create new table on database. All right, what do I want this table to be called? Registrants. These are the people who are registering for the sports. And I've got four fields name, captain, gender, dorm. So four fields. I'm going to click Go. And now in here, I get kind of an overwhelming interface, partly because my resolution is kind of low on Sanders' screen here. But it's just asking me to tell it what these columns are going to be called. So in Excel, I just literally type them. A database is a little fancier. It wants to know what the name of the fields are, what data type is going to go in them, and so forth. So let me just type this in name, and then captain, and then gender. And then dorm, but these all, shouldn't all be integers. So notice in this drop down, this database called MySQL supports a whole bunch of data types. Some of them are strings or text, some of them are binary,、uh, some of them are floating points, some are dates and times. And what's really nice, to be honest, about PHP MyAdmin, it's kind of a learning tool unto itself. You can kind of teach yourself a little bit about what MySQL provides. By just reading the menus and picking what makes intuitive sense. In this case, I'm not going to use text. I'm going to use something called varchar. This is a variable length string. Now, how long is a person's name supposed to be? It feels like,、uh, like maybe 100 characters max, something like that.、Um, I'm going to say 100 characters max for a typical person's name. Captain, OK, a y you know what? I'm going to actually make captain be a Boolean because it's just going to be true or false. Gender, you know what? I'm going to use something called an enum. I only want to allow two values in this field. So I'm actually going to enumerate with single quotes either F for female, comma, or quote M for male. And what this means is it's kind of, it is a textual field, but it's an enumeration. Only one of these two values is allowed for my particular implementation here. And then I have for dorm,、uh, dorm should probably be varchar. And dorm names, yeah, they're less than 100 characters each. Now there are some other features, and we'll discuss these over time, but I'm just going to leave the rest of this blank. So don't get distracted by all of your choices. I'm going to click Save. And now, what you see up here, what's also nice about this tool is you can actually learn what SQL syntax is by way of this program. So, SQL, Structured Query Language, is a database language. It's not specific to MySQL. Any of these popular programs, Oracle and the like, support this language called SQL, SQL, which allows you to get data from a database and put data in a database. Now, it's not all that interesting to learn the syntax for creating tables, and this font is kind of poor on this screen, but notice it says create table, mail in lecture, dot registrants, name, captain. Dot, dot, dot. What this program does for me is it you know, shows me the syntax it just used to create this database. It's just a front end to simplify my life. So now I see a reminder of what I just created. So all of this information here tells me what my database now looks like. So my goal is to insert some values into this database. Well, let's see how I can do this. Well, one, I could manually, especially if I'm the proctor and some student calls me on the phone or doesn't know how to use the web, they still are sliding this piece of paper under my door, I can do it manually. So I click the Insert tab and I can say, OK, a y David really doesn't know what's going on.、Uh, captain, he's going to be,、uh, nope, not a captain, not qualified male. And then let's say Matthews. So I can just do this manually. And this is not the value add of a database because the whole point is not to do this manually. But I can do it just to get me started. Because now what it executed is this syntax insert. So it turns out that SQL supports some fairly basic uh, sequ- uh, instructions. And the quick list is just this select to get data,、uh, insert to add data, update to change data, and delete. So essentially, four, these are the four most important struct,、uh, constructs for SQL with which we're going to manipulate a database. So, what I just did in this example here using this graphical tool, it did the syntax for me insert into mailin lecture registrants the following fields with the following values. So, I want to mimic this same behavior. So, what I'm actually going to do now is this I'm going to go back to my code here. 
I'm going to go into my public HTML directory and my source code for today for Frosh IMs. And now I have Frosh IMs 8.php. So let me pull this up, version 8. Aesthetically, it looks pretty much the same. But this time, instead of copying out and just emailing that proctor or myself or Jansu, we're actually going to insert the data into this database because then you can imagine taking some time and actually writing a web page that not inserts, but selects that same data from the database and shows it on a web page. So, case in point, when you actually visit cs75.net slash staff, we did not implement this web page in XHTML. We wrote a PHP program that actually queries our database, grabs all of the staff members from a staff table, and loops over them in alphabetical order, and then generates the XHTML dynamically. So it's the same idea, because again, I don't want to have to maintain XHTML for 60 different people. Much easier to put it in a database and dynamically generate it as you see fit. All right, so here is my Frosh IMs 8. And notice the only difference for this front end is that I'm submitting to register8.php. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and open register8.php. And here's what I'm going to do. First, a sanity check. If the user failed to give me a name or gender or dorm, forget it. Reject them, send them back to Frosh IM, slight typo, don't look yet. Slight typo, send them back to Frosh IMs 8.php. All right, but if they don't screw up and you don't exit, continue executing. So it just takes a few lines of code here. So let's see. The first line of code, and I've just revealed my personal password, MySQL connect. How do I want to connect to the database using PHP? Well, I want to connect to what's called local host. So when you want to connect to a database on your own server, you generally call it local host, but you would be told this by the system administrators, or in our case, the course. Then this function expects a username. Then this function expects a password, and then semicolon. That opens a network connection to the database. But then there's going to be 300 plus databases living on this server. In fact, 900 databases, because you're going to get one for PSET 7 and 8 and final projects if you want it. And so I need to select using this function, MySQL select DB mainland lecture. So this is going to say, connect to the database and use this lecture. And because I provided a username and password, I'm only going to be allowed to call this line of code if Malin actually has access to that particular database. So this is just authorizing me for access. Now, how did I know any of this stuff? Well, in fact, one of the best things about PHP so it has some downsides, and it is potentially a messy language. But actually, and actually, it's search. Uh, let's do this. MySQL connect. So PHP.net will become a friend over the course of PSET 7 and 8, because frankly, of all of the languages we'll play with, it is by far the best documented. You can literally learn most of the language but just by RTFMing what's on this website. I mean, to be honest, and it's no uh, overstatement, after learning C and C++ and like Perl on my own, I mean, I personally literally learned PHP by IMing a friend over AOL Instant Messenger back and forth, just peppering him with questions. Like he blocked me after that. But that was literally testament to the relative ease with which you can kind of pick up some of these new things. You got a question, all right, Google is now my friend um, instead of my friend. But, um, <laughs> But it is relatively easy to bootstrap yourself. So realize it's very much deliberate that you know, we wave our hands at some of the details. So I went to php.net. I typed MySQL connect into the search box. And voila, I now have the documentation for this function. Now, it doesn't matter so much all of the details here. But what's really nice about the documentation, because those man pages, as much as we preach them, they're kind of arcane, right? Sometimes it just makes the problem worse when reading the documentation, because they're not always that clear. PHP.net's nice because it always comes with examples. So down here, we see the name of the function. This is admittedly a little cryptic, so we'll come back to that and we'll see easier functions over time. But I'm going to scroll down here, and now here's examples. My god, this is all I want to do. If I want to connect to a database, I call MySQL connect. I pass in this and my username and my password. And then there's some other techniques here too. So constantly refer to the PHP documentation if and when you have questions uh, over the course of those P sets. So, Here's the code. I've connected to the database. I've selected my own. How do I now insert the data the users provided me with? Well, the goal is to get the contents of that post uh, variable into the database. Well, let's see. I'm going to declare four variables. Name, which is right here. Captain, which is here or here, depending on the if condition. Gender, and dorm. 
Now, what's with some of the crazy syntax here? Well, name is simply going to be the value that the user gave me, but users can be obnoxious and they can try to break into your web server. They can try to break into your computer by providing bogus input. And we've discussed this before, really a problem on the web because it's so easy to pass inputs to people's programs when you just have a browser. So, this admittedly stupidly long name function, MySQL real escape string, is the function to call. For any time you use this library to access、uh, MySQL databases, this makes the user's input safe. If they put some crazy syntax in there that's designed to break your database or steal your data, this function, MySQL real escape string, makes that not a problem. So, just as a teaser, and we'll talk about this at some point, if a user got malicious and didn't type in David as their name, But delete as their name. The, the point is, you don't want to pass the word delete to something like a database lest it actually delete your data. And this happens all of the time because people fail to、uh, massage their data with functions like this or to scrub their data, so to speak. All right, so this just puts the name, but it escapes it using a very safe mechanism. Now, captain is actually going to come in as like an on off value, it's going to come in as a string. So, I'm just going to check if captain is non zero. So, if the person checked that box, declare a variable called captain and make it a bool, make it a one. I could have said true, but I, actually, I intentionally said one so that MySQL gets a one. Or if they didn't check that box, assign this variable a zero. Gender, same thing as name. Escape very safely whatever they checked for gender. And for dorm, same thing. Escape whatever they typed in for dorm. And now, the only line of code I need to execute here is this. I'm going to Declare a variable called SQL.、And、this is just me being anal. I like to create my string in a variable and then do something with it. So SQL gets the following value insert into name of the table. In parentheses, I now specify a comma separated list of the fields I want to insert. Pretty easy. Could be any order. I chose this one. And then, and it's wrapping, so let me just hit enter once to clean this up a little bit. Then I type in the word values. And then notice, Close parenthesis here, open parenthesis here, and then now notice I'm using single quotes to quote each of the strings name, gender, and dorm, but because captain's a bool, I just pass it in. So in the end, I have a string that reads insert into registrants name, captain, gender, dorm, values David,、uh, zero, male, M, Matthews. And that is SQL. That is the language called SQL that I just so happen to have embedded. In a program written in another language called PHP. So now, if I want to tell PHP, execute this instruction on the database to which I have a connection, I simply call MySQL query, passing in this string, and voila. That should do the insert automatically that I previously simulated by clicking some buttons. So let's give this a try. So right now, if I click browse, I see that, OK, I just have one user, David, zero, M, Matthews, and I did that manually. So let's go to the actual web form here. Let me go to Frosh IMs8. All right, so I'm going to type in now, let's say, Jansu, captain, female, and I don't remember, let's say, Applicourt, register. All right, you are registered really. Now let's go back to my database, and this is just a tool. I want to see what's in my database. I'm going to go ahead and click browse again, and voila. Jansu's been inserted into the database. Now, very simple. We haven't really solved a big problem here, but again, assume this is now Model UN or some student group's problem. Now you can have hundreds of people going to a relatively simple web form, clicking submit, and now you have a table of information. Well, what can I now do with that information? Well, let me do this. Let me make a quick and dirty file called a quick and dirty program, which is just geek speak for saying let's do this fast and not necessarily the best way. Let me copy、um, register.8.php. Call it registrants.php. I'm going to open registrants.php. Let me get rid of my comments at the top. I don't need to validate anything. I do want to connect to the database again. I don't need to scrub input. I'm not going to take any input from the user. And this time, the query I'm going to execute is this I'm going to say select star from registrants, and that's it. So, this SQL instruction is actually going to select information from the database. Let me scroll down here, and I'm now going to say, let's see, I've executed the query, but this time I need to care about the result because I want information back. I'm not just putting it in. So, I'm going to say result gets MySQL query's return value. And now I'm going to say、uh, iterate over results. So, while row gets, it's called MySQL fetch asos, associative array. Result. So this line of code is just going to ask iteratively, give me a row, give me a row, give me a row, and each time it's going to put it in dollar sign row. 
And so what do I want to do with this information? Oh, interesting. I don't really want to put it atop my web page. So let me scroll down here. And let me butcher most of my code here. And what I'm actually going to do is steal this. One, two, three, four, five lines of code. I'm going to move them to the bottom of my file. I'm going to jump into PHP mode here. I'll indent just to keep things a little pretty. And now I'm going to close PHP mode. So what I'm going to do here is simply print out, let's see, I want to print out for the first person row. And what's the person's name? So it's name. Print out the field called name. All right, now I want to print out, oh, this is XHTML. Let's print out a line break explicitly. So not backslash n. This is a web page now, br. And now, yeah, that's enough. I just want to print their names. So let me click Save. Now this is registrants.php. Let me go to my file here and type registrants.php, enter. Voila. Now I have an administrative interface where the student group leaders can actually see who's registered for this particular thing. So where are we going with this? Well, in problem set seven, you're going to be handed a bit of a framework. So we're going to give you some code to simplify some things that you know, it's not worth getting hung up over initially. So we'll get you started with this. But you're going to implement a few different features. So one, we're going to hand you a login mechanism so that users can actually log into your website. But unfortunately, we're not going to hand you the ability to create accounts. So initially, you'll have to go to something like PHP MyAdmin, and the PDF will tell you how to access your account, what your default password is, and all of that. So you'll just use the Insert tab initially to create a fake username and some uh, passwords for yourself so that you can actually start logging into this CS50 finance site. But that's not very interesting because then you're going to add the feature, not just to register accounts via the web, but to get stock quotes. So you're going to have a web page called quotes1.php or something like that. You're going to have a little form asking for a stock symbol and a submit button. The user is going to type in G-O-O-G, enter. That form is going to submit to another PHP file. And what's that PHP file going to do behind the scenes probably? going to contact who for the data? So literally, Yahoo Finance. And we saw, and I'll make this code available, the little four lines of code, five lines of code to talk to Yahoo, get back the current stock price for Google, put it in an array. You can then certainly print that to the screen very easily. So that's not so bad. Then it gets a little more interesting. You're going to have to create the ability to buy and sell these stocks. So by default, each of your users should get something like $10,000 in virtual dollars in their database. So rather than just have fields like name and dorm in this database, we'll actually have another field in there called cash. How much cash does the user have by default? And you'll probably, in fact, have another table. So even though we just used one table for Frosh IMs, you probably want a table that's going to keep track not just of your users, but a separate table, a separate Excel spreadsheet, if you will, that keeps track of the portfolios of your users. What stock symbols have they bought and at what price so you know what their net worth is. And then finally, you'll need to keep track of this history so you know what the user has actually done. And just as we will finish problem set five and the so-called big board, we will replace this big board with another. We'll actually debut a little stock trading program, which is so much fun when the uh, stock market is in the condition it is. Oh, that's cute. You're the only one in this room with access to that account. <laughs> that's beautiful. Why don't we just end on that note? See you Monday. <laughs>